stand to say we want to hide in the blood of Jesus where the devil can do us no harm but more than just hiding from the enemy Lord Jesus more than just taking cover from the threats of the enemy we hide in that place because there is peace your word tells us that in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures evermore and to look upon us, your sons and daughters, as we gather in this place, with myriads of needs, our issues are manifold, Lord Jesus. But we came, Lord Jesus, whether our faith was strong or staggering, we came to this place. Won't you do what you do with people that come to you? Heal, Lord Jesus, save, deliver, make whole, restore, replenish, reveal, Lord Jesus teach us Lord God correct us pull us into your love build us up Lord God strengthen your church strengthen your church strengthen your people Lord God for those who came into their house weak and frail Lord God strengthen them this morning for those that came into their house at crossroads speak to them in clarity Lord Jesus for them that came hurting and tired, heal them deeply, Lord God. For them that came lacking and poor, enrich them with your word this morning. For those that came discouraged, Lord God, encourage your people. Because outside of you there is no life. Outside of you there is no hope. And Lord, though we came to this place sometimes skeptical in our hearts and minds, we came anyway. We dragged ourselves like those lepers. We shuffled into the house of God. Do what you do with those who come to you. Do with those who are with what you with what you do with those who show up at your doorstep. Your word has said that no one that calls on the name of the Lord will be put to shame. You've said that no one who came to you will be turned back. We came, Jesus. Regardless of where our hearts are right now, regardless of the issues that still follow us at home, regardless of what the marriages and relationships we are in look like, regardless of the nation that we stand in today, we came, Lord Jesus. Do what you do to those who come to you. We yield ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. We acknowledge your Lordship in this house. We acknowledge that only you are able to save. Only you can truly heal. Only you can truly satisfy. Oh God, would you satisfy your people this morning? Where earthly things have left us dry, Lord Jesus, satisfy us. Oh God, won't you redirect us? Where we have gone out, oh God, to drink from broken cisterns. Oh God, won't you rewire our taste palates, Lord Jesus, that we would once more long for the clean brooks of water that you offer, that which is found only in your presence. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship your name. Just a few more seconds until you just lift your hands if you can and worship Jesus. He's worthy. You are worthy, Lord God. You are worthy, Lord God Almighty. You are worthy. You are worthy, O oh God. You are worthy. You are worthy of praise. You are worthy of our coming. You are worthy of every strength, every ounce of strength that was summoned today to come to this place. You are worthy, Lord Jesus. You are worthy because in you there is no darkness. In you there is no disappointment. every song that has been sung today you are worthy of every heart and every hand that has been lifted you are worthy you are worthy Lord Jesus of every resolve that has been made to come into your house today you are worthy you are worthy you are worthy great and mighty God limitless in strength 
boundless in energy. You are worthy, O oh God, that knows no end to your power. You are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy. And we worship your royal name today. We crown you today with many crowns, declaring blessing and praise and power and wisdom and authority and glory from age to age and generation to generation. They belong to you alone. honor your name this morning Lord Jesus as we cry out you are worthy you are worthy you are worthy and deserving oh God Lord Jesus, this is our confidence today that you have promised it in your word in Matthew 18 and 20 that where two of us have come together in your name, there you are in their midst. We want to decree and declare today that this gathering is as unto you, Lord Jesus. We gathered only in your name, not in the name of the service or not as a practice of Christians. We gathered in your name, Lord Jesus. Your word has said everywhere Jesus went, he did good. And so our confidence as we gather is that because you're here, you are already indeed doing good. You're doing what is needed for your people. So we release ourselves to your counsel. We thank you for gathering us around your table. We know of a truth that you never gather your people for naught. You're not about to start now. Therefore, we allow you to be big and be God. Show yourself strong. We honor you, Lord Jesus, as you speak to us. Our hearts are ready to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together. Celebrate the name of Jesus. He's worthy. Come on, celebrate the name of Jesus. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you and we honor you today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated in Jesus' name. As we take our seats, let's put our hands together, celebrate Jesus as we appreciate the worship team. Thank you. The Lord bless you and do you good in Jesus' name. Bwana Yesu Asifiwe. Come on, Bwana Yesu Asifiwe. Please turn to your neighbor, tell them Jesus is here. Turn to one more person who believes you a bit more, tell them Jesus is here. Do you believe it? I wonder what you would look like if you knew that you were seated in the presence of the creator of the world. I wonder what it would look like for you, because Jesus is in the house, amen? Fills my heart with so much excitement to know that there is healing in the house today, there is restoration, there is salvation, there is the breaking of impossibility. In this place today, we know that Jesus is here, and everywhere Jesus is, great things happen, hallelujah. My name is Brian Moshigadi. I'm born again and Jesus is Lord over my life. I'm so glad and so honored to be a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who has saved me and rescued me by his blood at Calvary. And I am standing here today only because he made a way and the way has a name and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Um, I want to also say thank you. Um, and to be grateful for the opportunity of standing here and share the word of life together with all of us. It truly is the honor of my life to serve God and his people here at DCIKZ. Um, receive greetings from Bishop Dr. Jimmy and Pastor Alice Kimani, who are not in the house today, but they are ministering um, along the Eastern Bypass. Uh, but they, are, they know we are here. They were here in their first service, and then they went to minister. Uh, do you receive the greetings? Amen. Amen. And just to go right into the word of God, we're going to be looking at building up faith. Building up faith. That topic can be interpreted in many ways, and we're going to be looking at, at all of them. 
building up faith ni kama kujenga imani building up faith is like the build up of faith like step by step or little by little and it could mean many other things that's our working title we're going to go right to the book of mark chapter 8 we're going to read verse 22 to 26 mark chapter 8 verse 22 to 26 i'm going to read in the new king james version i'd request that we read it together the bible says then he came to bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him so he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him he asked him if he saw anything and he looked up and said i see men like trees walking then he put his hand on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly next verse then he sent him away to his house saying neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town lord we ask that you speak to us in accents clear and still because we pray this in jesus name amen it's an interesting story in the book of mark chapter 9 a uh, chapter 8 that we've just read and there are several things that we are able to pick out from this story now this is one of the interesting stories because it's not recorded in other gospels or it's not recorded by other of the evangelists or the other yeah the other gospels in um, matthew luke and john so it's interesting because it's an area of interest to want to just dwell here for a bit it's only recorded um by him but we can find some some similarities even though it's peculiar we can find some similarities of another story just like it and i'm just going to mention some of them if you read the previous chapter in mark chapter 9 by the time uh, chapter 7 by the time we are getting to mark chapter 8 if you read that story just before we come into this story of mark chapter 8 we find that there's another man that jesus has healed in almost similar fashion it's also, it's, it's a way that Jesus is healing that we don't see in many other places. Actually, it's not mentioned in many other places. So it's interesting. It catches our attention for more than one reason. If you look at what the story has that we are looking at, both of them in, Matthew chap in Mark chapter 7, sorry, and in Mark chapter 8 where we've just read, both of these have several things in common. In both of these things, um, it is Jesus that he, he separates the person, separates the person that is suffering. He calls them apart. The other thing that he does, uh, other than taking them outside in some sort of privacy, not all privacy, but in, in some sort of privacy, the other thing is that he uses... Um, the same means of touch and saliva, very unlikely ways of, of ministering to his people. He's using touch and saliva. You don't see that a lot. I see a couple of us cringing when we say Jesus used saliva. The other thing that he uses is that he, he places some sort of secrecy upon them. He lays some secrecy upon them, telling them, do not go back to the town or don't mention this to other people. And all of these things have their own significance. There's a reason why the Lord mentions this to the people and says to them, and we're going to be looking at the significance just as we, are, as we continue in the journey. But I want us, first of all, to look at the setting because we, it's important for us to know where we find ourselves. Now, the Bible has started by telling us in verse 22, then he came to Bethsaida and he, they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. It is important for us to realize that Jesus Christ has come into Bethsaida and why it is important that we realize Bethsaida has been mentioned. Bethsaida was a village um, I think a bit much later, if you continue reading in the book of Luke, you find that it is now being referred to as a town or a city. But at this, at, that was later. But at this point, it is called a village, and it is located uh, near the um, Jordan uh, region on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, that's just some geography which might not be very, very, but it's important for us to know where it was. Now, it is recorded in this account that some people brought a man, the Bible has said they brought a man and begged him to touch him. I want you to realize the pe another peculiarity of this story is that it was not the man that begged Jesus Christ to touch him. In several other stories of Jesus healing, which I'm sure we've come across, Jesus, the men, the sufferers are the ones that are crying out to Jesus, sufferers, <laughs> are the ones that are crying out to Jesus saying, Lord, have mercy. Do you remember the story of blind Bartimaeus? When he's crying out and saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So loud that other people are actually telling him, you need to, Chesachini, my friend. 
There are other people, other stories. Um, if you read, for instance, the Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 9, we might look at that in a bit, but you can look at that. Matthew chapter 9 from verse 29 going downwards, where it is recorded many miracles that Jesus did in quick succession, or it appears as if it was in quick succession. One of the things that happens that they have in common is that the sufferers are asking Jesus to remember mercy. This is peculiar because the man here is not asking Jesus for anything. Actually, we do not see him saying much apart from when he's saying, I see people looking like trees. So that's an interesting thing. Why it is interesting also tying it down to Bethsaida is because Bethsaida is one of the towns or one of the villages where Jesus did a lot of miracles. Now, most of those miracles have not been recorded in plain sight. We can't see that this happened here and this happened here. But the Bible has said to us in the Gospels that many of the things that Jesus did were not recorded or there would not be enough time or space for them to be written down. Do not be misled to thinking that just because... that. The, the only things that Jesus did in his um, about three or so year um, long ministry on the earth were only re are the things that were recorded. No, Jesus did so much more. Why is that important for you to remember that Jesus did more than is written? Because it is important for you to set it in your mind that our God is limitless. I want you to turn to somebody and tell them our God is limitless. So, he, it is important for us to remember in the back of our minds that Jesus Christ did much more than is recorded in the word that we re than we read here. And why it was not recorded is because there wouldn't be time for us to read about the saving power of Jesus Christ or his healing power. Another thing why it is important for us to place where the story was happening is because by the time Jesus was walking in the earth, there, were no, there, there was a lot of suffering and pain and sickness and disease. There was also a lot of superstition. There was also a lot of witchcraft at the time when Jesus was coming into the earth in that particular part of Israel. When he was coming to that territory, there wasn't modern medicine as we know it. Blindness was one of the things, for instance, the story that of the man that we're reading about. Blindness was one of the things that the people who uh, were, were, were found to be blind were considered to be cast with a curse from God. Either those ones who were cast, who were born blind, or those ones who fell blind along the course of life. Some of the, of, the, of the remedies for blindness that used to be given were such crazy things. I was reading in some of the commentaries in the morning that, um, that some of the remedies that they used to give, you know, some of the treatment that used to be recommended for people who are blind was to take the blood of a rooster, the warm blood of a rooster, jogo, and then to mix it together with raw honey and smear it upon the eyes because at least it will make the... I want you to just imagine, before I even finish the statement, think about what kind... I see some of you cringing, just thinking blood and honey and applying it upon the eyes. In other words, it was some sort of primitive society. It was not what it is right now. I want you to understand that Jesus coming into the situation at that time was light truly shining in darkness. It was a hopeless situation that if you got sick, you just had to live with the sickness or you just had to apply the crazy remedies that were being given by the people if you want to get better, if you wanted to get better. So Jesus truly coming was truly what John says in John chapter 1, the light shone in the darkness and the darkness did not understand it or overcome it. Buona esu asifiwe. It is important for you to understand that in your mind as we are setting this story because then you realize that him coming to the situation was truly hope coming into a hopeless world. Hallelujah. Because you might be deceived into thinking that Jesus was coming into a world that already had solutions. Jesus was coming to heal people of conditions that already had a remedy. They could just walk into the chemistry, apothecary, and ikiwe tu ambiwe, okay, go and take this, like we are doing right now. No, at that time there was no medical intervention not like we know it right now so jesus coming and healing the sick was a big deal i don't want you to imagine that these miracles that we are reading about were just some ordinary things i know it's possible for us to water them down but we would be watering them down to our own detriment jesus performing and doing was a big deal then as it is right now hallelujah 
So he has come into that region. Many miracles had been recorded. We've just said that not everything could be written because our God is limitless. He, his power knows no bound or no, no, knows no end. So not all these things could be written. So Jesus has come into Bethsaida. If you read the Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 11, all the way from verse 21 to 24, we'll not look at it. You can read it in your own time. It, uh, we, re we find Jesus rebuking some of these cities. Some of the cities that he's talking about here is Chorazin and Tyre and Sidon and Capernaum, um, one of the cities where he's actually his, like his headquarters, where he was coming from, where he was hailing from. And why he's rebuking them in Matthew chapter 11 is because these cities had seen the mighty works of God, his mighty works in these cities, yet they, they did not believe. I don't want you to get it wrong. It was not like they, they cast out Jesus or that they were unhappy with his ministry. It's not that they, they sought to crucify him. It's not like they were the ones who were shouting, crucify him the loudest. No. Their only reason, the only reason why Jesus spoke against them or the only reason why he rebuked these cities is because they simply disregarded him and his works. They did not believe him. They were what we would call in today's language, lethargic. They were apathetic. They were just like there. They did not care what was happening. They did not think about me. They were just there. Oh, I'm a fanya mujiza. Hmm? Kuna mtu wakoku anafanya mujiza. It is just the same as any unbeliever that has not yet yielded their heart to Jesus. When they have already heard that there is a God in heaven who involves himself with the affairs of man. It is also the same as the believer that could be seated right here today in this service. But there are some areas in your life that you're not yielding fully to God. Because to he, to you, it is just another kawaida thing. Coming to service in the presence of a great and mighty God, to you is just an ordinary thing. It's just a fulfillment of religion. It is just so that you can tick off some good and earn some nice brownie points with God. So that you can say, I am a church-going believer. The problem with these cities that Jesus is rebuking is not because they were so terrible or they closed, shut off their gates to him. No, it was because they were apathetic. They simply disregarded him and his ministry. And so it is important for us to realize that Bethsaida was one of them. Actually, if you read John chapter 8, in verse, uh, Mark, sorry, chapter 8, verse 12, where we've just read, we find that Jesus is saying, saying to them that you guys are always asking for a sign and a sign. I want to tell you the truth. The Bible says, and Jesus sighed. To sigh means like he go to a mechoka. I'll go a mechoka now. He just sighed and said to them, I tell you the truth, no sign shall be done to you people again. Oh, may it never be said of that in Jesus' name. May Jesus never sigh in our homes and say, Ah, it, you'll not see another sign. Because you have seen enough signs and you don't seem to believe. You have seen enough, enough you've heard enough things that I'm doing, and you just don't seem to believe. You are just there res resigned to faith. It's like, ah, I can't believe it. I can't be life. You've given up on trusting God. You've given up on, expectat uh, on expecting it. Expectating. You've given up on expecting from God. Because we believe, the Bible says the expectation of the righteous shall not be cut off. Shall never be cut off, actually. But what does the world say? Expect less, get disappointed, less. So what have we believed? The world or the word? We believe the word. We believe the world. We are supposed to believe the word. Because when we believe the word, it doesn't matter how many times I have tried. I will say, if Jesus is in it, have I toiled the whole night? Yet, master, at your word, I will throw in my nets again. Hallelujah. I will believe one more time. God, it seems like nothing is working. But are you saying that I, sh I need to not give up the habit of coming to church, of meeting together with other believers, that we may encourage ourselves and encourage each other as we look forward to that day? If that is what you're saying, Lord, one more time. I will come. I might have been hurt in that place, but I will still come anyway. I might be feeling unwell, but I will still drag myself and come to that place. I want you to imagine, if we truly believe that we are living in a hopeless society whose only answer is Jesus, we will not be comfortable just staying in our own cocoons and not dragging ourselves out and saying, by the way, like those four lepers that we find in the book, is it first or second Kings? Like those four lepers, we will drag ourselves and say, if I stay here, I will die because here there is no solution. If I go there, I might die. But I had rather die while going to Jesus than live while staying here. I want to be where Jesus is. I want my faith to push me into that place where Jesus is. It might be uncomfortable, but give me that uncomfortable thing if it means being where Jesus is. Hallelujah. 
So that was the problem of this man. Let's try and quickly look at it, of this city called Bethsaida. So let's quickly look at now, having looked at the setting of the place. The Bible says they came to Bethsaida, verse 22, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. We have already looked at the sort of man that he was. We said that Bethsaida was greatly inhabited. It was a half-heathen city, half-heathen, so or village. So it was inhabited by people who really didn't believe. They were excited to see God work. It was great to see, to know that God, Jesus used to pass by there and work. But they didn't really believe. So you could argue that this man, the reason why he was not the one crying out. You see, most of the men that received healing, most of the sufferers that received healing from Jesus were men that cried out to Jesus themselves. But this man did not cry out. Actually, not in one place. He did not even reinforce the chorus of the people. As the people were bringing him to Jesus and saying, Lord, have mercy on him. He was not like, hey, Nicole, have mercy on me. No, he was just silent the whole time. It must be because this man also had a lot of Bethsaida in him and very little of the believing in him. So the people were just like, oh, have mercy on him. He was just like, oh, well. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it is I. That should be had mercy on. Let's see what this man can do. So Jesus Christ is looking at these people. So this man, we've already uh, ascertained that he was a Gentile found in that place called uh, Bethsaida. And in the second place, it was other people that have brought him. It was not he himself. We find some encouragement in this story. I don't know whether you're like me. I find some encouragement in this story for those people who have little or weak faith. If you're in the house today and your faith is little, your faith is weak, I bring some encouragement to you that just by coming to a place where other believers are, you might not be able to say much for yourself because you just came to this place saying, what? As other people are crying, Lord, have mercy on Kenya. Ata wewe ni Kenya ukotu hapo. Kwa hivyo kama God ata have mercy on Kenya, ata wewe utasaidika. So some encouragement for you, don't give up. Don't stop coming to church. Don't quit going to your home cell fellowship. Don't throw out the fellowship, fellowship of believers. Don't stop reading the word. There are some things that have been promised, and if nothing at all, you will enjoy the common grace of God. So don't stop. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, don't stop. That is some great encouragement. Maybe this man will ask himself, why would he care for me? Why would he, why would, why would he, why? but whether he was there or not, you see, other people were crying out. This man might not have said, Lord, yes, have mercy on me. But he also did not say, no, don't have mercy on me. I don't believe you. That's the difference between this man who was just riding on the faith of other people. You might be here, you're riding on the faith of other people. Don't stop. You have every permission to ride on the faith of DCIKZ. Stay in that place. Don't stop. Tell somebody, tell somebody don't stop. In fact, the Bible will remind us of the same in 2 Corinthians is it chapter 12, I think, verse 9. It says, my grace is, is, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. This is the Lord responding to Paul or speaking to Paul, saying to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Don't throw in the towel because my grace is yet sufficient. Don't give up because my grace is yet sufficient. I know you've waited for too long, but my grace is yet sufficient. I know you're feeling like you're weak. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You might not be where you used to be, but stay on there because the alternative is no better. Unaenda wapi? Unatoka kwa Yesu, unaenda wapi? You remember where the disciples are saying, are crying out, where, tuende wapi kwako kuna uzima? Tuende wapi kwa, me, where, kwako kuna amani? You're saying to Jesus, where would I go? It is hot, but sana inda wapi ni wapi kuna baridi uko inje? Msindanganye. Kama kuna baridi uko inje, ati baridi kuna afueni. <laughs> Come on. If you feel like it, if you think it is better outside of Jesus, it is better but temporary. It is temporal betterment. Give it a bit. Because the furnace shall surely soon be heated seven times hotter outside of Jesus. But when you're in Jesus, even though the furnace had been heated, has been heated seven times or even twice the amount hotter, you still have the fourth man in the fire. You will not be consumed. Utatoka ukimba misi teketei, misi garikishwi, siogopi, mana ukonami. Stay in Jesus. Like that man. You might not be saying much, but at least if you're going to, if, when, if you know when you open your mouth to ask for help, you're going to condemn yourself. <laughs> we 
we had our prayer night just the other day, last Friday. It was powerful. If you missed it, you missed it. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but it was interesting to find that at some point in the night, ulikuwa unakaa tu hivi unajiekelea kwa ukuta. Haujalala. Ni vinyu unashindwa sasa unaweza ukasema nini na vinyu hiyo miaka mbili imekucharaza since the last kesha. Unakaa tu hivi unanyamaza tu. But just by being there, <laughs> Jesus is just looking at you and saying, come my child, come. Let me take care of you. Hallelujah. Verse 23, as we continue, the Bible says, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? Now I want you to realize, Jesus did not have to do this. He did not have to take this man by the hand. He did not even have to talk to the man. He did not talk to the, that woman with the issue of blood because the woman touched the hem of his garment and immediately the bleeding stopped. The conversation became, it came afterwards. Of course, we might say that the conversation after made the woman much better than it, it, she would have been if the conversation had not happened because every conversation or every word of the Lord makes better. It makes us rich and does not add sorrow. But he did not have to touch this woman, he, this man. He did not have to have a conversation with him, did not have to do anything, but still. He did it. Why? Because Jesus was more interested in the wellness of this man. He was interested just much more than the physical health. He was interested in the soul of this person. He was interested in building up the faith of this man. So Jesus was like, aha. Uh -huh. It's interesting actually also to note that this is one of the last miracles that Jesus performed within Galilee. All the other miracles that he does after this. By this time in Mark chapter 8, we are about halfway in the book of Mark. We are coming now to what the end of the ministry of Jesus recorded according to um, Mark. And so when he's doing this, this is among the last miracles that he does out inside of Galilee. So he begins to now exit. And when he exits, he does other miracles but outside. And then he continues now to come into a ministry of empowering, teaching, and equipping. If you continue to read from chapter 9 all the way until he dies and rises again, we find that now he's just invested in really teaching his disciples, in really equipping them for the work that they will need for the gospel to continue until a work that they did faithfully until now we are able to proclaim the goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Jesus takes this man by the hand and what does he do? He leads him off. We have already read that. And when he's reading him, leading him off, he's not doing it because of privacy. He's, if he wanted just privacy alone, he would have taken him into a house, into a room, and done the miracle there. But Jesus is doing this just as what we said in chapter 8, where we read of Mark, verse 12, when he has already said to Bethsaida, you will not see another sign. So he takes him outside of the village. He's not doing it uh, so that he can uh, fungia himself with a man. I would imagine there are some people that are curious on Lucas, but just in prophecy, in, in fulfillment of the prophecy that he has already spoken, so that he's doing it outside the city. These guys in Bethsaida have already seen enough. They, are not, they, are not, they don't deserve to see more. So he's doing it as a lesson. It is also important for us to note, as we begin to learn this, that Jesus intentionally sought to be with this man alone. We said he did not have to, but he wanted to. He wanted to spend some alone time with this person. Imagine the man being held by Jesus, being led outside the village. This man did not know where they were. He was blind. He was just being held by a stranger, being led outside the city. I want you to imagine what was going through the head of this man. This man did not ask for any help. It was the people that cried out, Master, have mercy on him, or Lord, have mercy on him. And Jesus took him. So this man was just there. I want to imagine in his heart he was thinking, there's a man who has some interest in me. This man that is holding me, I, I don't know much about him. They are saying, they are calling him Jesus. I hear they are saying he can do miracles. I'm just imagining the monologue that was happening in his mind. And he's saying, ah, this man seems to have interest in me. He seems to have compassion with me. I want you to think compassion on me. I want you to imagine the many times you found yourself in solitude. Have you gone through a situation in life where other people would not be able to understand it even if you explained it to them? Have you gone through such things? Have you found yourself in some things that you try, you want to, I really want to open up. But I'm wondering now, hata nianzie wapi kwa kweli. Hamna background information. Ndukianza kuwa pati ya background information, there is not enough time or space in the world. So wacha tu ni kayapa. The Lord is taking you intentionally through those things. Just so that you can sit down with him. And I want to let you know, people, that there is no beautiful or better place to be than in those alone, quiet times with Jesus. Some of the greatest and most, most faith-growing times in our life will happen when we are completely alone 
with God. I want you to imagine the story of Jesus Christ himself when he's being led into the wilderness, Luke chapter 4, by, by, by God himself, the Bible says, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit after the baptism, was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And he was there 40 days and 40 nights. He came out better for it. Why? Because he had been led there by God. It is beautiful to be alone with God. Because even when the gate crasher, the enemy who is never invited to the party but somehow sneakily finds his way in, even when he comes, he's still not going to put you down. Why? Because you're in the company of our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Do not run away from the quiet times with God. Sometimes it might be those times where you're alone because of you're on a sick bed. Sometimes you're alone because of some sorrows that you're not able to explain to people. Sometimes he keeps you away from the things that you want, chosen spheres of activity that you desire. Maybe you want to have a job and that job will keep you outside. And for a season, the Lord just wants you inside with himself. Sometimes he will keep you alone by removing those people that are near from you. Have you had a friendship that has ended that you don't even know why it ended? I'm doing your nini. You're just at a situation. You're in a relationship where you're like, he's my all, he's my all, Akish is my everything. And then, Gafla Binvu, Punde si Punde Kwakweli, Unapata Mko separated, hashtag single. I don't know, Juliza, Tuli, you, Ata ye akiwa kule ya na Juliza, Tuli wachania nini? Sipati picha. Sometimes the Lord maybe just wants to call you to himself. That's some advice for my young people. <laughs> All right, my time is almost up. As we continue to finish this in verse 23, and when he had spat on his eyes, when he had spat on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. I don't know whether you're like me, but many times I have asked myself, what was the reason for the spit? Sometimes you think, Lord Jesus, spit? Spit ni saliva. Ni mate. Mate. So I went to try and understand, and I found many comment commentators like myself just are wondering, why spit? And then I found that many comment commentators also agreed on this one thing, that the warmth of the saliva was like a salve upon the eyes of this man. It was a, it was a nice solution. It was the warmth of the mate was soothing to some of the wounds that he might have had on his eyes. The, the, the reasoning that goes around is that this man must have known he, ma he used to see before. So if he was not seeing, right, because he knew what trees looked like. So you see later he's saying, I see men, but they look like trees. He knew what a trees look like. So for some, by some reason, he stopped seeing. Um, he had wounds on his eyes. And so saliva was like soothing. I don't know why you're looking at me like that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So you know saliva is soothing. Watch a coquette here for all polish. You're thinking, saliva? That's <laughs> all. So that is the reason. The saliva is only here to signify another thing that we know about our Lord and Savior, that he was moved with compassion. The reason why Jesus did not just heal this man from afar. You see, most of these people who are sick and downtrodden and broken, these were downtrodden and broken, were people who were outcasts of society. The religious leaders would not have anything to do with them. The political leaders would certainly have nothing to do with them. They, if somebody was sick or blind, they were the dreads of society. So for Jesus to come and actually stoop down to the level of this man, that was compassion. That was a different kind of ministry. I want you to imagine the time that Jesus came and found you where you are seated and he came and looked into your situation. You, that nobody wanted anything to do with, but Jesus came and he said with you, I can sit with you. That made all the difference, guys. That is all the more compelling reason why I want to follow Jesus all the days of my life. Because when I was nobody, he found me. When you were nothing, he saw you. 
Imagine he looked at you and he saw interest. Akaona haka ka mtu ninakaangalia hivi. Wengine wanasema ni kijana fupi round, lakini ninaona anaweza akanizugushia ijili, aipeleke mbele, ingia hapa ndani. Some of you are looking at at me, but you know you know that the Lord has called you for something. You know that he saw you and he wanted you. He desired to have you. And you when somebody told you wanted so bad to be wanted. So when you heard that there is somebody who is wanting you, you are like ako happy. Ako happy huyo mtu ananitaka. But the problem is that we forget. We forget that we were wanted by the Lord of Lords. He didn't have to, but he wanted to. I have said it here many times before that Jesus did not have to make us his son, his brothers. God did not have to make us his children, co-heirs together with Jesus Christ, but he wanted to. It would have been enough for God to forgive us of our sins. But no, he went and gave us the entire full all inclusive package. He said to us come right inside here. Sija kusamehe dhambi tu, nimekufanya sasa umekuwa mwana. The Bible will remind us in John chapter 1 verse 12 that to all who received him, all who believed in his name, he gave them the power, the right, the privilege to be called children of God. Children not born of the will of the flesh, but born of the very will of God. God, he has called you in and he wants it that way. He was not out of choices, he desired. Why? Because moved with compassion. That is what Jesus used to do. That's what he's doing in this house today. Maybe you came to this place and you're feeling downtrodden and discouraged. I bring you some good news. Jesus that saved you, Jesus that saved others, he's in this house and he's saying, I still have need for you. Oh, won't your faith be built up in the house today? Maybe you've been lied to by the year that we have gone through and it's been difficult and heavy and you're thinking, ah, atayo mamboyo mungu staki. Oh, don't fall into the deception of the enemy because the Lord is here and he's saying, oh, if only you knew, I still desire to fellowship with you. All you need to do is to open your mouth wide. Let me feel you. I remember Pastor Esther shared that with us during the prayer fest on Thursday. Open your mouth wide, Psalm 81 verse 10. Open your mouth wide and I will feel you. Charles Pudgeon actually says something to that same effect. He said many times, it is our cup that is small, but we, bra- we blame the fountain. Our cup is small, but we blame the fountain. Our mouth has been opened just a little bit, but we blame the fountain. Today I pray that as you leave this place, you will desire, you will make a resolve to live outside and be together with Jesus like that man, just, just follow him wherever he's leading you. I want you to imagine, just as we finish, I want you to think to yourself, if this man had been led through the seaway, you know, outside the village is where it's not very organized. Ndani ya the village, ndio kumepangwa, kuna njia, kupita, kuna, uko inje kuna, amepitia uko kwa zile black jacks, jua, kuna njia, uko, ni outside the village. Amepitisha uko, this man was not complaining. I like this man for that. His faith was something else. Haku anaongea, but yo kunyamaza yake ilikuwa important. Anaongoza tu uko, ana, ma black jack, and said, we, hapo kuna uchungu. We, hapo tumepitia kuna kikitu. We, yo ni muiba. But haku anakomplain, anafuata tu. Sometimes you'll be led out into places of solitude and what the Lord is doing, beloved, is that he's building up your faith. He's building up your faith. This is actually the only miracle I think recorded of Jesus Christ that happens in stages. The reason why it is happening in stages is not because Jesus was not able to do it like this. In fact, I think it is the only one recorded on purpose. So that we don't think, if there were many that were recorded of stages, we would be misled into thinking that our Lord and Savior cannot do anything by the first try. So it is that way. It is solely, it is single on purpose. So that we do not build our faith around that Jesus has to do it again and again. But for us to also remember that when he does it like that in little, the principle of little by little, when he does that, it is for you. Not for him. It is not for the lack of his power on his side. It is so that he can bring us. It is part of his compassion. It is part of the compassion of God. So as we bring this to a close, three things that we want us to remember. Number one, Jesus desires to take us to the place of solitude. We've already said that. That we may, places that may not be pleasant to us, that we may otherwise avoid, but whether in solitude or in community, we must be open to his pursuit for our souls. We must go through the presence of the Holy Spirit so that we may grow in understanding. It is often in this communion with God that we experience fully his healing touch. 
Hallelujah. Number two, Jesus knows our hearts, hearts, uchungu, and he meets us where we are in order to take us to the place of complete redemption. Jesus did not begin to deal with this man and say, oh, I'm not going to heal you just because you don't believe me. You, you belong in Bethsaida. That's why you are like those other people. That's why you're not crying out to me. Jesus is not petty. I want you to understand that. He will not stand and say, beg me, beg me. Get down on your knees and say that you love me. No, 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 no. That's why the rain falls on the wicked and it also falls on those who are righteous. Because our God is not petty. He is not standing to wait so that you can make him feel wanted. No, 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 no. He's still going to heal, still going to save, still going to deliver. But more than just give you the things, more than just enrich your life, he's interested in your heart. Hallelujah. Number three and final. God fills the water pots to the brim but not beyond the brim. If we stop bringing our vessels, the oil will stop flowing, like that woman that we find in the Old Testament. If we stop bringing our vessels, the oil will stop flowing. If we stop trusting him, if we stop believing him, at any point the man this would have decided where his healing will stop. I want you to imagine when he was asked by Jesus, how, uh, unaona, how is it like? The question that Jesus is actually asking him, he placed his hands on him and asked him if he saw anything. What did the man say? He looked up and said, they look like trees walking around. I see people, they look like trees walking around. The man is the one who decided where the healing will stop. Not Jesus. Not because Jesus is limited, but because Jesus is actually trusting you. Many times we find in scripture, Matthew chapter 9 that we just read, verse 29 says, according to your faith shall it be unto you. Do you want to rise up on your feet for just a minute? It says, according to your faith shall it be done unto you. According to your faith shall it be done to you. It is not about him. It's not that he is limited by, by, by things or the circumstances. It is according to our faith. Many times our cup is small, but we blame the fountain. Today we leave this place opening up our mouths wide, releasing ourselves completely to him because the fountain is limitless and endless. It will flow so long as we have faith. So long as we open our hearts to him, it will flow. Do you want to lift up your voice and say, God, build up my faith today. I want to trust you for the big things. I want to trust you for what has been termed impossible. I want to trust you for those things. Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice and pray. Ask the Lord to increase your capacity to build your faith in the name of Jesus. Ask him to stir you up. Ask him to bring you into a place of solitude if that is what is required. If that is what is necessary, ask him to cause you to be more like him in the name of Jesus. That you will trust in his limitless possibilities. You will trust in his ability to do much more than you can think, ask, or even imagine. You may easily over expect the creature or the creation but we cannot over expect God. He says that we cannot over expect him. We can expect from him and expect the biggest and grandest. The Bible will remind us in Isaiah 7 and 10 where he says ask for anything. Make it as big as you want. Ask for the moon. You can never over expect God, lift up your voice right now and begin to tell God, I want that faith. Build up my faith in the name of Jesus. Build up my faith. Build up my faith in the name of the Lord. It honors God when we greaten our expectation upon Him. It honors Him when we increase our expectation. It honors God when we increase our expectation of Him. In fact, when we increase our expectation, it is us sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. It is us saying, God, I am asking you this great thing, but I am asking because you're the only one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly measurably more than I can think ask or imagine I don't know just for one last minute I don't know what you have stayed from asking God for because you think it is too big I want you to mention it right now you might be afraid that your neighbor will hear you're asking for such a grand thing but I want you to do it in faith today on this 14th day of November in the year of mounting up want you lift up your voice and say God this is exactly what I am asking asking you for. I am making it loud. I am stating it proudly because I want you to know that I am greatening my expectation of you. I want to build up my 
faith this morning because I know you are limitless. There is nothing you cannot do. Let others hear about it. If anything, they will form the welcoming party. If anything, they will form the team that will testify and say, I once had him ask about it. I once asked, he asked, had her request God about it and look at what the Lord has done. He will sing like Elizabeth and say, this is what the Lord has done to remedy my unfortunate situation because he is limitless and there is nothing that he cannot do. Receive it today in the name of Jesus. As the Lord is building up your faith, trust him completely. Release yourself to his power. He can purify you. He can sanctify you. He can cleanse your life. He can cause you to desire for him alone. He can cause you to hunger and thirst for him. He can heal your body. That's fine. He can bless you with money. That's okay. But that's not all he wants. He desires you to trust him more. He desires you to come into a relationship with him. He desires to live and dwell with you. And when all this is said and done, after you have lived a victorious Christian life here on earth, you can spend eternity with him, singing praises to the great I am, the one that called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Father, we thank you and we bless you. We thank you for every prayer that has been made, every prayer of crazy faith that has been lifted up in this place today. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We seal it with the blood of the Lamb. We ask the Lord Jesus, in a matter of time, you shall bring it to pass. We have asked, oh Lord God, but we are not done asking. After we leave this place, oh God, we will continue trusting you. We will continue to greaten our expectation. We will continue to widen our expectation because we know it honors you because our asking is our sanctifying of you in our hearts and so Lord Jesus we widen our mouths that you may fill them we don't want to blame the fountain anymore because this morning we understand you can heal in many ways in whatever methods Lord Jesus you're filled with compassion you are more willing to give us what we desire than we are to even receive it and so Lord will not limit you build our faith Lord Jesus build our faith build our faith Lord God build us up in you build us up that the world will be filled with believers true believers whose faith has been built up on the solid rock that cannot be shaken. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Continue to follow it up, dear God, to accomplish it because we pray these things in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you.